in the world is happening on Wall Street? Two year no yields went from 190 to 166. The market is now down Because we're now down 43%. This is the craziest day they have ever seen. Who knows seen where this is going to end up? I mean, this is volatility. The Dow traders are standing there watching in amazement. I don't blame them. The Dow traders are standing there watching in amazement. I don't blame them. The Dow traders are standing there watching in amazement. We've got to find one pound out of every hundred the government spends and save that rather than putting up this people's budget taxes. This is needed to deal with our country's debts. This is the unavoidable budget. He talks about austerity. I call it living within our means. My research took me to a place, the Hooghly River in Kolkata in West Bengal. There, the politics of austerity rolled out about 20 years earlier than they did here in the UK. So by looking at this place and the ways in which austerity began there and then affected people's livelihoods, we can reflect on our condition. It's a place that for this river, for 300 years or more, has been at the centre of global trade. And even some of the ships that were built on the Isle of Dogs in the 19th century now lie at the bottom of that river. Levels of trade have gone up since liberalisation in the 1990s. All of the very showy goods of globalisation that end up in the shopping malls of the city come up the river. It also represents to people who live along the banks the forces of fertility, in particular embodied in the form of the goddess Ma Gonga. And yet this river has also become a ruined landscape as the austerity regime has meant that less and less investment has been made in the sort of infrastructure of the river, less and less investment in dredging the river. One of the most precarious and dangerous forms of livelihood on the river is the men who go out at low tide into the centre of the river. They uh, go out on small wooden boats um, and they climb out of the boats and stand up to their necks in the water and dig up sand from the bottom of the river and load up the boats and then bring them back at high tide. They described it as sort of putting themselves in the trust in the hands of Margonga that she could easily decide to end their life if they didn't treat her with respect. State debt, until about 20 years ago, was a political relationship and worked according to political rhythms. So when the central government needed money to invest in infrastructure or the public sector, it would just create money with the central bank or borrow it from individual banks. And it would do that according to the rhythms of political decision making. And then it would pass that debt down into the public sector as a political relationship. So those debts might not ever have to be repaid. But 20 years ago, that mechanism totally shifted. And what happened was governments started issuing state debt bonds to banks which banks then issued into the financial markets to allow speculation on the back of. And it started out as a project within the World Bank, as it seemed to be a way of getting around the problem of third world debt crisis. So it was seen as a way of productively drawing capital towards governments, as a kind of magic solution, in a sense, for government debt. Now that might not have seemed like a very big change, but it actually was a very big change because it meant that governments now had to look to the sentiments of the markets before they could think about their economic policies. They would have to think about, you know, if we, if we took a certain measure, would that cause the rates of borrowing to increase on the markets? And once they started to introduce these new financing mechanisms that were linked to the market, 
for uh, government activity. It also meant that they started to treat all of the organisations under them, the public sector organisations, as if they had financial credit relationships with them. And they started to charge them interest on debt. They would never freeze debt if the organisations couldn't repay it. And hence you get what I, what I saw on the Hoogly. Um, we can also understand this as the origin of um, austerity policies in the UK and Europe as well. Although we think of liberalisation and globalisation in India as being a regime of opening up the economy to flows of capital and flows of goods, um, what it was in fact was the introduction of a regime of debt accounting within the public sector in which debts which had been accrued between the centre and um, institutions like the Port Trust were, had been political debts which would never have been repaid. They were just money, in a sense, given to the public sector in order to create productivity. But what had happened was these had been turned into financial debts and had to be repaid with interest, actually, just like financial debts suddenly. So that turned the port trust on the river into this kind of extractive machine. <laughs> I'm not a politician, so my solutions are very utopian solutions and quite big solutions that are all about rebalancing that relationship between the financial markets and, and the government and governments across the world. The first of these would be the ending of derivative bonds and the creation of sovereign debt bonds within markets to end the government's reliance on these market cycles. They would also involve the opening up of central banks to democratic processes um, so that the effects of their central bank policies could be open to political discussion, so the creation of elected boards for central banks. They would also include perhaps the creation by the government of political kinds of debt bonds, which they would develop not with markets, but with socially useful organisations, say universities, pension funds, whatever else. And they would get into debt relationships with these organisations with long-term perspectives rather than market organisations. There also needs to be, at the more kind of macro scale, a dissolving of the World Bank, the ending of a kind of jubilee of all of the debt relationships that the World Bank and I have had with international governments at the most utopian <laughs> level. If we think back to the post-war period, what happened then was, for example, in the UK and other countries suffering from debt after the war, um, those debts were forgiven by banks or there was a creation of money by the government in order to invest in vital resources like the new growing National Health Service in the UK. And we can think of a possible return to those policies in the present. If we got rid of the marketization of sovereign debt, we could then, the government then could in effect print its own money again. It could monetize and create its own resources and generate a national wealth fund, which could then invest in particularly social useful, socially useful occupations and in the public sector itself without having marketized debt relationships intervene. But at the sort of more grassroots level, I think there needs to be sort of political movements built around the question of the public sector and what has happened to it and whether the forms of financing of the public sector are creating greater inequality or not um, and who they're producing profits for because of course the system as it exists now is producing extreme accumulation at the top of the system so that the financial sector is making money not only out of markets but out of public sector institutions. So that kind of politics would be the politics of organisations like Debt Resistance UK that are questioning the financialization of local authority government financing in the UK and are calling for social audits of local authorities. And in taking this perspective, I'm centrally guided by the perspective of, in particular, shipyard workers on the Hoogley River, who really argued for the increase of forms of mutuality, forms of mutual support and, and recognition within the economy, so that even they, uh, sort of precarious workers, their role in the economy would be recognised. And they wanted, they called the economy that existed on the river um, a kind of 
immoral economy that was driven by the burning of the stomach or individualistic needs, and they argued instead for a kind of social calculus, a measure of measuring of economic policy according to the effects that it had on everybody and whether those effects were equal or unequal. So there's a kind of philosophical orientation that I've learned from people on the Hooghly River that for them is influenced by Hindu ideas in particular and their sense of the fertility of the river Hooghly itself and the goddesses that, that are associated with her. Doctor in a mobile phone, a kitchen, other name, another facility kitchen. Amra Kajuchi Agmatro Jagabola had petted Jalan. 